Before we get started, just touch your chest, touch your heart, and uh, put your hand on there. And Father, we just thank you that you open the eyes of our understanding. Yes. Dig deep in our ears and give us the ability to hear. Yes. And we give you praise and we give you honor and we give you thanks for it. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Okay, I want to uh, I want to read you something. I, I didn't have this book with me, but uh, This is out of a book by Dr. Carey, uh, who, uh, who was a very prolific writer. And I'll read from this book of Dr. Carey's. This, is, this book is entitled, uh, God Man Made Flesh. And so I warned. This is uh, a real popular book that he wrote but I want to read you something that's in another book that he wrote that I didn't have to have, but I, I was able to pull it up. Actually, Chris sent me this out of another book that Dr. Carey wrote. And I want to read this to you because it's very controversial to what we've all been taught. And, uh, and I know that because I was taught the same thing you were taught. And the first three or so years, three or four years that I pastored, I pretty much taught the same thing that you've been taught all of your life. Mm -hmm. But all during that time, I I was a seeker for truth right out of the start gate. I mean, I wasn't happy with, quote, religion, traditional religion. I didn't see it offering to mankind what mankind really needed answers for a living life, answers to help them now. Mm -hmm. And I had read a lot of books even before my first pastorate, but I, I read outside of the box of traditional religion. You know, I read books by Napoleon Hill, Dr. David Swartz, The Magic of Thinking Big. That was a book that really, really began to set my my eyes on studying scripture was Dr. Schwartz, The Magic of Thinking Big, which was not, it was not a, a religious book at all. It was more about being a salesman or selling and, and thinking outside your limited scope of, of being. And so uh, I started reading a lot of books and it caused me to ask a lot of questions, which when I, I took a seminary course and occasionally I would have to go with a group to Thomas Jennings Dake, who was the uh, who wrote the Dake Bible. I mean, he did the Dake annotated reference Bible and had the whole Bible memorized, which was just just phenomenal to me to see that or to be a witness to someone that had that kind of a mind. And uh, I would ask him a lot of questions out of the start, you know, because his first thing that he would teach was the Bible is a history book, and the Bible has to be taken literally. And, and everybody has been taught that and everybody thinks that. That's not, that's not the truth, that's a lie. That is a lie right out of the start gate. And it's a hard, that's one of the hardest pills to swallow. If you ever can swallow that pill, mm -hmm. then you can get past a lot of the things that limit you in your ability to receive the truth. That, that stops you almost dead on your, in your tracks because we were taught that the Bible, 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 <laughs> is an infallible book. That's a lie too. Men's hands are all over it. They added to it, took away from it. And actually the truth is, until the Council of Nicaea by Constantine, who was one of the ruthless, most ruthless leaders ever to live, and it's a shame that people just don't Google that. You can Google that and find out he had his nephew killed, who was only 11 year old. He had his sister-in-law killed. He had his wife killed. He killed his son. I mean, he was a murderer, and he was the founder of what you and I call Christianity. He founded what you and I believe at the Council of Nicaea, and then organized the, the, the Nicaean Creed, 
which the Nicene Creed, you can go into many Baptist churches and it's on a great big plaque on the wall and it says, we believe. And it'll go into 12 or 13, what we believe. All of them right out of the Nicene Creed under the direction of the most ruthless murderer that ever was, Constantine. All you have to do, if you don't believe me, Google it and you can, you can find it for yourself today. It's right there at your fingertips if you'll dare to look. Also, prior to the Council of Nicaea, that's 325, common era, there was no book called the Bible. It didn't exist. And so when Constantine organized the Council of Bishops at that period of time, they had to write what they call the book that you and I hold and call it the Bible. They had to write that book and changed a lot of writings to organize this book. That's a fact. It's the truth. You can find out for yourself. So prior to 325, there was no book called the Bible. There were many, many books. And in 1946, 47, 48, when they found the Nag Hammadi books, they opened a treasure trove of ancient books that were, that were circulated prior to 325 and Constantine and the Nicene Council. These books circulated all over the whole Mid-Eastern Empire. And when Constantine organized the Council of Nicaea and then they put together the Nicaean Creed, they sought to find all of these books and burn every one of them they could. They even went so far as to Alexandria in Upper Egypt and took that library, one of the greatest libraries ever in existence of mankind, and burnt that library. Mm -hmm. And took all the books they could, and obviously I hope that they're in the Vatican Library, maybe one day that Vatican Library will be opened up so we can see for ourselves. Many of you, and I say this all the time, just hearing somebody and believing something don't make it true. That's right. Even seeing it don't make it true. But I say this a lot. Seeing is the first step to opening your eyes to understand truth. If you can see it, then you can say it, then you can create it. That's the pattern. And God set that pattern down. So if you can see it, and that's why I do this, that's why I use those clips, that's why I say a lot of the things I say. Because I want you to be what God offers for you to be. More than you want it yourself. And I've sought my whole life now, all these years I've sought to do that, to be what I see the truth is about being. So I want to read you this. This is very controversial to the way you've been taught to think. Okay, I know that, but I wanted you to hear this up front. Primitive Christians, in other words, the Essenes, you hear me talk about the Essenes, there's not a lot written about the Essenes. The Essenes was a group of all cultures that gathered together in the mid, in the somewhere in the Mediterranean area, Asia Minor area, and they gathered together in communities, and they called themselves Christians. They were also called Essenes, and they were called Christians around 325 BC. Get that, BC, 325 to 350 years before what you call Christ. And they call themselves Christians or the Christed ones. Why did they call themselves that? Listen to this part. This is out of one of Dr. Carey's books. It's primitive Christians. In other words, the Essenes fully realized and taught the great truth that Christ was a substance. Now I'll interject something that he said. If you look this word up, Christ, in any concordance, any dictionary, if you look it up in the Greek, it will be the Greek word Christos. And the word means oil. Just like a lot of you cook with poison called Western oil. <coughs> Instead, you should be cooking with olive oil. Not the poison of Wesson oil or canola oil. All those things are poison. They design those oils to kill you. But anyway, that's what the word Christos means. It means oil 
It also means anointing. That anointing comes from the word oil or unction. And unction is where you speak out of your inner being. That's where I want to go. That's where I try to go is to my unction. My inner being. I want you to hear what my inner being is saying, not what Lynn is saying. Because it's my inner being that's in connection with the great being. What you call God. So God is within me, and I want to draw off that. So now listen to this. The primitive Christians, in other words, the Essenes, fully realized and taught the great truth that Christ was a substance, an oil, and an ointment contained contained especially in the spinal cord. Hmm. Is that where that oil is at? Absolutely. But it's 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 uh, root or source is in your glands. You remember my stick man? Seven mm -hmm. stick man? That's the seven major glands that build your body. So now listen to this. This ointment contained especially in the spinal cord, consequently in all parts of the body. As every nerve in the body is directly or indirectly connected with the wonderful river that flows out of Eden, in other words, the brain, where the pineal gland and the pituitary glands release this oil or this water to water the garden, the body. The early Christians knew that the scriptures were written in ancient Hebrew or Greek and were allegories, parables, or fables based on the human body, fearfully and wonderfully made, as it says in Psalm 134. So I say that, see, I'm not the only or the first person to ever say the Bible is a book not about history, but the Bible is a book about the physical anatomy, in other words, the human body. And as you, as you begin to open your eyes and you begin to open your ears to see and to hear that, you realize this is a marvelous book to you, no matter who you are. But if you read this as a history book, it will confuse you. You won't be able to understand it. You will say it's contradictory. It will cause division. It will co it's cause more wars than any other book in the world. But if you read it and you understand that it's not any of those things, it is a book about the physical anatomy and about how God built its temple to live in, to move in, to be in, it'll change your life. And you begin to realize the things that you long for, the things that you want to see, are not outside you. They're right in the very being of you. So, by saying that, I, will, I want you, if you have a Bible, I want you to go to Psalms chapter 3. If you, if you need a Bible, we got Bibles. If anybody needs a Bible, there's a bunch of them over there. Psalms chapter 3, if you'll turn over there and look at this. I want to talk about something that's very close to all of us. Psalms, Psalms chapter 3. Just open your Bible to that place. Then we're going to go from there. And maybe into the book of Exodus, which is the second book in your Bible. Psalms chapter 3. And then we'll probably go over to Exodus. Psalms chapter 3. Now I want to ask you a question now that I've said all that. This is a very popular question in Christianity. In all Christianity. It doesn't matter if you're a Methodist or a Baptist or an Episcopalian or a Church of God or a Oh, anything you want to call yourself. Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, you just, it's, the, the list is, it, it's just, I don't know how many different groups there are today, but they're in the thousands, I'm sure. They are. And that is one question that they all ask. 
one of the questions they'll ask you is, are you saved? Isn't that one of the first questions they'll ask you? Are you saved? And I'm asking you that question. Are you saved? And of course, if you ask somebody on the street or somebody that had a clue what you're talking about, they'd probably say, saved from what? It's a good answer or a good question back to the question. Are you saved? Mm -hmm. Saved from what? Or what does the word say mean? And here's another one that they will ask you that's predominant. Have you experienced salvation? Have you prayed the salvation prayer? Have you ever heard of those things? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does all that mean? And does it have any validity to it? Well, number one, it has all the validity in the world, and what it means is not what you've been taught. So, I want you, and, and I'll say this again about those two words, save, S-A-V-E, or salvation, is used four, four to five times to one more in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. So I would say this to you, or to anybody hearing or listening, the Old Testament is about salvation. The Old Testament is about being saved. But what does that mean? Does that mean if you have experienced salvation or you're going to get saved, you're, you have a promise of a cabin or a mansion in glory? It ain't got nothing to do with that. It ain't got anything in the world to do with something in your afterlife. It has everything to do with your right now life. And it's your right now life is the only life you're ever really going to get to live until you come back again and live your right now life. You can't live in yesterday, but you can sure remember it. <laughs> that's, what, that's the problem with many of us. We still, we still live living in the past. You can't live in the future, but you can sure dream it. When can you live? Right now. And you're either, you're either living your right now life to its fullest ability, or you're not. You have hindrances, you have handicaps, you have addictions, you have this, you have that, that hinder you from being everything that you possibly can be. And all of those things is what? Those hindrances, those habits, those different things are the very things that hold you from experiencing what salvation really is, what it really means. And so I want to try to drive that point home, and I want you to see it because I will use probably more Old Testament Scripture than I will the New Testament Scripture. I could turn you into Romans chapter 3 and show you where Paul says, y'all believed my lie and called it the truth. And you didn't even know that even Paul boldly wrote that out in plain sight in Romans chapter 3. You believed the lie that you've been taught and you call it the truth and it's not. So let's just go back here. If you found... Psalms chapter 3, and uh, look with me in verse 7. It says, Arise, O Lord, save me. Hmm. Now that word Lord, I'm going to put it on the board here, comes from the Hebrew. It's, it's a word that should not be a word, but they, it's this yod, hey, wav, hey, and it's a formula. And in the formula, yod is carbon, hay is nitrogen, uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, wait a minute, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Those are the four gases, those are the four basic building blocks to build a physical body. Okay, every one of you are made up of this right here. So actually, this is a formula for the definition of you. And then what happened when your mother and father, your mother pushed you out of the womb, your mom and daddy decided to call you something besides yo te Like my mom and daddy decided to call me Harold Lee, and I don't know where they got that. Harry L. H-A-R-I-E-L. Harry L. That's how my mother spelled my name. Which actually means uh, a uh, har a in Hebrew actually means a uh, air and L in Hebrew means God. So my name, Harry L, means an heir of God. And Lynn means a priest or a preacher. 
Now, my mom and daddy, I, I mean, they named me that, but I don't know that they had any idea of that. I mean, they said anything else. My daddy nicknamed me as I was growing up because I was, I was so full of energy. I was just, you know, I was just a little wild, energetic kid. And daddy called me preacher. I don't know why he did that. <laughs> he, he hung it on. But anyway, arise, O Lord. When you see that word Lord, you think about that, it's referring to you. And what I'm saying to you, arise yourself. That's what this is saying. Arise, save yourself. So you can't do it. You, you can do it. No one else can. You can save yourself. You can do that. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for Thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone and hast broken the, the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs unto the Lord. Salvation belongs to who? See, this is not a passage of Scripture that's pointing out there somewhere. You're the one taught to point out there somewhere. Because you think the Lord is out there. You never see yourself as the Lord because you are the Lord. You're the Lord of your life. You're the Lord of your ship. And wherever you as the Lord of your life, the Lord of your ship, directed to go, that's how it's going to go. Nobody else is doing that. You know, and every one of us are born with different... Now get this, listen to me. Every one of us are born with weaknesses and strengths. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, sad to say, our weaknesses will begin to dominate our ability because we fall prey to them. Mm -hmm. And then we don't use our strength and our, our, our greater self to overcome our weaker self. Mm -hmm. So those weaknesses are given to you not to tear you down, but they're given to you to see the contrast between the physical and the spiritual. Mm -hmm. No, we don't see that. You know why? Many times our problem is ignorance. We just haven't been taught or we have ignored the things that are just right in front of us. We just don't pay attention. And I'm speaking that to myself. So many times we're born with psychological issues. Every one of us. I ain't got no psychological. Yeah, you have. We're born with psychological issues. Many times we are born in a, in, with deficiencies in physiological. I mean, we're, we're just born that way. Did God make a mistake? No. God gave, you are special. I don't care who you are. Anybody I'm talking to. I'm talking about a vast audience of people. You are special, period. But you have got to go into yourself to find out your specialty. And then you have to accentuate that. In other words, you have to draw on that, not on your weaknesses, because it's your weaknesses that keep you pulled down. And that's what salvation is all about. Salvation in the Hebrew, actually I wrote the words down here somewhere, I think. Now, listen to this. The word salvation is this word, yesh -uh. Have you ever heard that word? That word also got translated as Joshua. Have you ever heard of that word? Well, who is the character Joshua? Joshua is the one who picked up the mantle of Moshe, Moses being drawn up out of water. In other words, he took the mantle of taking the physical body because that's what the physical body is. Moses, that's who you are. You're drawn up out of water. And Joshua, who is Yahushua, which is salvation, Joshua begins to take the people. First book after the first five books, the sixth book is Joshua. And, and that's, that's chronologically good that the way it put it that way. Joshua, what does he do? The first thing right out of the he's the deliverer. What's he trying to deliver? He's trying to deliver you from your weakness, that thing that holds you, and show you your strengths, that thing you ignore. <laughs> you see, your strength is in your spiritual source, and your weakness is in your physical source. Which one of those are you addicted to the most? I'm asking you that question. You don't have to go ahead and say myself, my body, my soul, my mind. But it is. That's the one you're that's the, the weaker one of you is the one that you give way to more than any other. Why you're not taught to lean towards your spiritual source. That's your power. That's your energy. That's that's your deliverance. That's your wholeness. That's your Joshua. That, that's where you get the and the word actually, yeah, Yeshua. 
I'll just give you the definition, and you can look this up in most any common Hebrew or Greek concordance. Yeshua, spelled Yod Shin Vav Ayin He, and actually it means deliverer, deliverance. It means health. It means victory. It means prosperity. How many of you would like some of that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello? How many of you would like some of that? Yes. I want some of that. I'll read it to you again. Yes, Uah means deliverance. It means health. It means victory. It means prosperity. It means be whole. W-H-O-L-E. Where That's where the word holy, H-O-L-Y, comes from. H-O-L-Y, holy, comes from you being Whole, W-H-O-L-E. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Every one of us in some place are not whole. In some places we're divided. In some places we're torn. In some places we're giving in to our weaker self. Mm -hmm. And it's the, and it's that's where you can draw on the strength of, of Elohim, who is God, the source. But if I were to ask you who is God, what is God, you you go and give me some all kind of different answers because you really don't know. They haven't taught us. They just haven't taught us. Who is God? What is God? Where is God? I mean, all of them, you know, if you have this idea that God is some old man out there with a white beard, white hair like me, well, that old man's standing in front of you. So you don't have to look nowhere for it. But if you've been taught he's out there somewhere building you a building, a home or a house or whatever you get, you get to go to, you're missing out on living the life that God intended you to live now, right. right now. So, so anyway, that's so that he says salvation. Verse eight: Salvation belongs unto the Lord. Who does it belong to? Unto the Lord. Who is the Lord? Yod Hey Vav Hey. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. Who is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen? Say, I am. I am. You're the Lord. So every place in the, you go see this word in the Old Testament. You think the Lord is referring to God out yonder somewhere. It's not. It's referring to you. You are the Lord of your life. It's just exactly like James said this in, in, in the book of James in the third chapter. He said the tongue is a little member. And yet it wails a huge power. How is that? It's with the tongue being like the rudder of a massive ship. That tongue turns the body whichever way that body wants to go. It's just like Jesus said, you're snared by the words of your mouth. It's just like it says in the book of Proverbs, life and death are in the power of your tongue. You speak those words. I don't speak your words. You speak your words. And you have to pay attention to them. You've got to learn to listen to them. You've got to say, what am I saying? Because whatever you're saying, you're getting. Because if you say it, you're sowing the seeds. In other words, if you see it, you say it, you create it. Now think about that. So you might pay attention to what you're seeing. You might just be seeing from your weaker self and constantly regurgitating or speaking out yourself to be continually bound in your weaker self. That's good. Really, is words important? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're seeds. I don't I won't ever get a garden if I don't sow a seed. And all of us sow seeds every day, all of the time, and don't realize we get crop from that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank God, probably the biggest part of them is sown on fallow ground. Hallelujah, aren't you glad? <laughs> thank God that they are sown on fallow ground. Mm -hmm. And if, since they sow on fallow ground, then they, uh, they uh, don't grow anything. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. But some do. Some finally take root and boom, there you go. You've got something to deal with. You've got something that you need to, to work with because it grows up in your life. Now if I go to the New Testament and I look up this word salvation in the Greek, the Hebrew is yeshua. In the Greek, it's sorterio. It means exactly the same thing. So when you go to the New Testament and you constantly read that word salvation, what it means is it means deliverance. What am I getting delivered from? It, well, if you want to call it the devil and look in the mirror and be sure you localize and centralize and know who the devil is and you'll find him just look in the mirror. <laughs> you mean the devil is that image looking back at me? 
Yeah, you're looking back to see if it's the image you're looking back to see if it's looking back. Yeah, it's looking at you. It's you. Mm -hmm. If you want to know who the devil is, the devil is not some entity that's run right and that's rebelling against God. That's foolishness. Anybody believe that foolishness is something wrong with us? And every one of us has believed that sometime. Think that God has got an enemy? That's, just about, that's ridiculous. God don't have no enemies. Ah, oh, Brother Lynn, the devil is the enemy of God. No, it's not. Diabolos, actually, it means your image in reverse. That's what the word means. Your image in reverse. In other words, you see yourself in the mirror. So if you want to find the devil, look in the mirror and he's looking right back at you. And you can tell him to get under your foot. Or it, or whatever. Get under your foot. So, so if you look up the word in the New Testament and the Greek, it's exactly the same meaning as it is in the Old Testament. It hasn't got anything to do with praying a prayer, asking something to come live inside you. What you want living inside you is already living inside you, or you are not going to be living. Amen. <laughs> it's just that simple. You can't ask it to come in there. You can't pray it to come in there. When you breathe your first breath, it come in there and made home. It said, this is my house. I built this house, then I built it to live in it, and thank you, I'm going to live in it. Mm -hmm. Now, you can do anything you want to destroy it. You can corrupt it. You can say all kinds of stuff, but I'm going to live in my house. Mm -hmm. I may not like what you do with my house, but I'm going to live in it. God loves you, period, no matter what. What you do, what you say, where you go, what you... I mean, mm -hmm. God loves you and stays inside you. And I don't know any other way to say that. But I don't know what God is. Ain't nobody ever told you what God is. Number one, He's not a man. I remember when I first started my walk, 27, 26, 27, 28, I was so confused. They kept saying, well, you've got to ask this guy Jesus to come inside you. I said, how in the world is somebody else going to get inside of me? I just, that just did not work in my, in my psychology. It didn't fit. I thought, I'm inside me. Ain't nobody else getting inside here but me. How am I going to get somebody else inside me? And I'd ask that question. I'd say, oh, talk to you, and that's foolishness. I said, well, it may be foolishness. That's what you're telling me. <laughs> and that, that's exactly what they told every one of you. Yeah, yeah, you know good and well it is. Yeah, come on, pray and ask Jesus to come inside your heart. Mm -hmm. Huh? Huh? Ain't that what you have? Mm -hmm. Well, my goodness, God's already in there. Yeah. And if you'll read the four Gospels, if you just go back and read them, even though they have been manipulated, added to, taken away, and twisted them up, so that they try to prove their ideology. You still find enough truth in there and you'll see where did Jesus say to go? The Father. The Father. Why? Well, because the Father is inside you. Jesus Himself said, He said in Luke 17, He said, don't go down to Jerusalem looking for God and its kingdom, but look inside yourself. How can you get any clearer than that? The kingdom of God is within you. It's not outside you. Everything I'm saying is already in you. Everything I'm saying you've already got. You just don't know it. I'm just trying to stir you up and get you to look inside yourself. Don't look in the mirror. Look in. It's all within you. Every bit of it is within you. So when you look in there, you'll find that. And in that, you'll find the salvation. You'll find the power. And that's what you're lacking. You're lacking the power to do or accomplish the things that you want to do or accomplish because you can't see it. You can't, you can't see it. That It's already inside you. It's in there. And so once you see that, you begin to gain power. You begin to gain the ability to do the things that you long for in your heart. So I want you to go with me now to... And I could go all through the Psalms of the Old Testament and show you this salvation that I'm talking about. It, I mean, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere there. And every one of us is looking for this empowerment. We are. Every one of us is looking for it. I'm looking for it. You're looking for it. I'm looking for it to help me in the areas where in my weakness has overcome me and gotten me in a, in, a, in a pickle. You know, and you are too. And so we're all looking for this, but many times looking in the wrong place. And you won't find what you're looking for in the wrong place. Take that. <laughs> Alright, go with me back to the book of Exodus. That's the fifth book in your Bible. Exodus chapter chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. 
just one verse here. We looked at this verse last week. I want to come back to it. Exodus chapter 30, verse 15. It says, The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. When they live, when they, when they give, when they give an offering unto the Lord, unto themselves, to make, this offering is to make, I want you to see what this offering is for. To make what? Atonement. A what? Atonement. Atonement. What is atonement? It comes from this word right here. At <clears throat> one. Meant. At one. Meant. At one. Meant. Atonement. What is atonement? It's being at one with yourself. It's not being divided among yourself. It's being at well, that's what atonement is. It was taught throughout the Old Testament. It was not a New Testament passage of Scripture. It's not taught. It was taught in the Old Testament. However, I'm going to read another. This is from Dr. Carey's book I showed you at the beginning. This one I brought with me. I want to read you what he says right here. There is no salvation or regeneration for man as long as he believes in vicarious atonement. Now, I mean, I'd say every one of you heard of that. Vicarious atonement. Where does that come from? Uh, that, that always, I always, where does that, the idea of vicarious atonement, where does that idea come from? Google it. Just look and see. You know where it comes from? Constantine and the Council of 325. Prior to that, there was no such thing as vicarious atonement. Didn't exist. Was not in the early church. Was not in the Essenes. Was not at all mentioned. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before the Council of Nicaea and then they come up with the Nicaean Creed. And in the Nicaean Creed, that's where this phrase come up was in that Nicaean Creed. And, and you know what? We've been hoodwinked. We've been lied to. We've been deceived by well-intended preachers. That's right. Th their intentions were pure. They didn't know any better. They were regurgitating something they had been told, something they read, whether in seminary or heard it in church. They didn't mean to. They were deceived and deceived us. So listen to this. There is no salvation or regeneration for man as long as he believes in vicarious atonement. The man who needs saving by the process is not worth the price. Vicar vicarious atonement means that God had to have a substitute for you because it wasn't any other way that God could deliver you or save you without a substitute. And who was that substitute? Hello. Who was that substitute? Jesus. And so Jesus was your substitute. You know, and I tell you this, Google it and see, there was no such name as Jesus until the 1600s. 400 years. Just Google it and see why there wasn't a J in the English alphabet. Wasn't there? There wasn't no J in the English alphabet. Oh, really? Then what did they use? If you look at the original King James 1611, it uses the word Adusus, which comes from the Hebrew Yehoshua. Salvation. Where did they get that? From the Hebrew, from the ancient text that I've just told you about. Yehoshua. Yeshua was the son. That was your that was your salvation. That is your salvation. So, if you believe in somebody else is going to do it for you, guess what? What would what would you if you are you waiting for somebody else to do something for you? My grandpa always said, if you want it done, do it yourself. If you just waiting on somebody to come do it, you're either lazy or you just don't know. 
I'm going to pick the side you just don't know. I'm going to go with that and say that's our biggest problem. We just don't know. And that's, the, I mean, that's the very key right out of the beginning, right out of the starting gate. You shall know the truth. John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said, you shall know. That's, I hammer at that. Knowing comes from your heart, comes from your intuitive being. It comes out of the core of your being. Your heart is what, where you know from. And, that, and when you know from your heart, you connect to that that you can do whatever whatever that you need to do. So I'll read this to you one more time. I didn't write this. Wish I had, but I didn't. But you can look this word up. You have the definition of vicarious atonement is, penal, is a penal substitution. So, and, and we know who that is. Somebody going to do it for me. Got to have somebody to do it for me. Can't do it myself. There is no salvation or regeneration for man as long as he believes in vicarious atonement. The man who needs saving by the process, by that, by that process, is not worth the price. Recognition of eternal unity will save man. Did you hear that? Recognition of eternal unity. In other words, when you recognize that you are one, with the eternal source itself. That's different. When you recognize that you are one with God itself, now you can tap into the power you need for whatever you need. That, and that's different. That's completely, that's completely different than, than uh, anything we've ever been taught, which most of us. Okay, I want you uh, now to go with me to uh, a place in your scripture, Genesis chapter 1. That's an easy one to find, Genesis chapter 1. And I want to show you something. Just Genesis 1, just go there and find that. I hope these are pretty close. And I'm going to ask you a question I asked you just a minute ago again. What is God? What is God. Well, I mean, you know, we've spent time, many times, and if you're kind of listening and you're on your toes, uh, you would, you could have shouted out an answer. And, uh, let's see if I can find it right here and I'll just read it to you. read you this right out of the scriptures so Old Testament book of Psalms I'm just going to read this to you just go over and find Genesis 1 because we'll talk about what is God what is God I mean it's a really don't you think that's a I mean first base don't you think that's a good idea if you're going to go to God if you're going to pray to God let's just say father if you're going to mother <laughs> Because in many, in many aspects, God is father, father slash mother, mother slash father. Both and. God is androgynous. Really? He's a man and a woman? You know, what is that, what do they call that guy, the, the, uh, the man that stands and the woman that's laid over there? Also, what do they call that? The, uh, and the, uh, antro, something, another man? Anthropomorphic. Uh, what? I'm not sure. No, it's a symbol. It's, it's a symbol that has a big... Oh, the Deluvian man. The Deluvian, yeah. The Deluvian man. I have to get also sometimes to stand and explain that to you. He's got a really... He's got it down pretty good. He can explain it to you. But y'all seen that, haven't you? Yeah. The drawing? 
where is a man stretched out like this inside the circle, mm -hmm. stretched out like this, and overlaid in him is a woman. Yeah. Y'all seen that happen? I mean, it's everywhere. It's in a, I think it was drawn what four, five, six, seven hundred years. Anyway, it's, it's a phenomenal hermetic. It's a hermetic comes out of Hermes Trismegistus. Y'all heard of Hermes Trismegistus? He lived thirty-six thousand years ago, and most all of ancient materials based off Hermes Trismegistus. But I ask you again, I'm going to ask you again. When Jesus said, He said, pray like this, Our Father which art. Who is that? Who, who would you say that if you're going to go to the Gospels and the story of Jesus, who would you say that's <laughs> referring to? Our Father which art. Help me out. Come on, just tell me what you think. Don't God. God, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. That simple word we have in English, God. So, if you're going to pray to God and He's in your heart, our Father which art in heaven, He's not out there, it's in here. Mm -hmm. Really, but I thought it was out there. Okay, that's fine. So again, I'm asking, what is God? I'm just to read you this one passage. God is Son. S U N. Hmm. And Jamie was talking about this morning. She finally tried to get what I was suggesting you do every morning when you get up, get up before the sun rises. Just take a few minutes, five minutes or so, and just sit and gaze into the sun. Because when you do that, you're gazing into the face of God. Ah, oh, can't be. You are. You're gazing into the face. I'll read this passage of Scripture again. I don't know how you get any clearer than this. God is a sun and shield. God is. If I asked you what is God, you could easily say it's the sun. That's you in. Now let me ask you another question. If they did away, if the sun all of a sudden decided to just totally blow up and not be there no more, would you be here? Would anything be here? No. Would there be no there would be no life? No. So, listen to this. So then the sun is the source of your life. The sun is the strength of your energy. The sun, and in the sun is where your power lies. So won't you would you not agree with me that one of the first things that you could do when you get up and you, you're alive again would be thank the very source? That's giving you this life? Uh, yeah. In other words, the, do an honor to God. And guess what? Now watch this and listen to this. When you, oh, when you get up in the morning and you take those first few minutes and you gaze into the sun, you will see the sun pulsing. You, you'll see this. It's, it, it's pulsing. And in that pulse, you'll see uh, coming out of it, you'll see these rays. Those are energies. And you'll see that energy will come into your being through the vehicle of your eyes and in those pulsations are the words of God. And what God is doing as you do that, God is writing its word on the tablet of your heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. So then where do you go if you want to know what the word of God is? Hello, everybody say within myself. Within, within, myself. within yourself. Did you have to pray a prayer to get that? No, all you had to do is just take five minutes and watch the sun rise. Or watch it set. Don't do it during the day, it's too bright. You mess up your vision, you can't see good. But do it in the morning. God is the sun. Now, come back over to Genesis chapter 1. Because if we don't get this right, and we are getting it right, thank God, we're getting it right. <laughs> Hallelujah. We are getting it right. Genesis chapter 1. And I put these circles up here on purpose, the way I put them up here on purpose, because of this, this circle represents the astrological wheel, or uh, a circle has no beginning and has no end. Have you ever heard anything like that? Do you know anything that has no beginning and no end? Everybody say God. God has no beginning and no end. 
Well, this thing that we call God is not an old man, but it is the Son. So the Son is continually in this revolution. No beginning and no end. Just forever, eternal, perpetual, constantly doing the same thing all the time. We don't pay any attention to it. What's He do? He's constantly working in, in its projection. Because the projection of the Son, our God, is its main, its, its main focus, its heart, its passion. Whatever it's projecting itself into, that's its passion. Guess what? That be you. Whatever God's projecting, whatever God's passion is, that be you. And guess what? That is a material manifest world. So if you're thinking about something out yonder that's not material, that's not manifest, you better think deeper. They may be just like, it's called no thing. That's what it's called because it's not anything to call it. Because it's just nothing. It's no thing. So where's God's focus? It's on the material, manifest world. What is this book we call the Bible? It's a book about the material, manifest creation of God, which is you. It's about you. The character's about you. The cities are about you. The rivers are about you. The mountains are about you. It's a book about you. It's a book about your life. And when you start to see that, so I put these circles up here. This one I have, I have it in quarters. And this is fire. That's the first quarter. Earth. That's the second quarter. Air. That's the third quarter. And water. That's the fourth quarter. Now, I don't want this to get confusing. This is taking this is taking the celestial wheel or the path of the sun or the path of God in four quadrants. Now if I take this one over here, I take the path of sun in 12 quadrants. So this one right here is called fire. This one's called earth. This one's called air. And this one's called water. And so I'll divide, and that will divide into that will divide into three sections. Watch this now. This, these three sections right here is where you get this idea. God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Or in other words, it's where you get the whole teaching of a trinity. And when you get the teaching of a trinity, you can actually do it like this. You can say spirit, body, uh, and soul. So that makes you a trinity. And everything that God is working toward in other words, the sun, because this, this is all about this you, this, and its path as it journeys continually around this manifest source we call the earth. It, it's about life, giving life, and life existing. This is, this is it. Yeah, you all ever seen that movie as good as it gets? That's a pretty yep. good what is this? Oh, Jack Nick? Is it Jack Nick? No. As good as it gets. And you remember the story, the theme of the story is Jack Nicholson. He has some mental problems. He's a writer, extremely wealthy, but he has some chemical imbalances. Some of the smartest people I know have chemical imbalances. Some of the smartest people I know didn't realize until they were in their late teens or even in their early 20s that they were either schizophrenic or had some issues like that and can be some of the most brilliant people that you know. But on the other end of the... I mean, I remember years ago when I first started in the ministry, I had a friend of mine who I grew up with him. His name was Gerald Harper. He was the president of what was back then the Dalton Whitfield Bank. His sister was schizophrenic. So he come and he said, Lynn, is there anything you can do for her? I said, well, I don't know, but... The Christian church says she's demon possessed. Y'all ever heard of that? Yeah. 
Well, I was gullible back then. I wasn't afraid of nothing. You know, when I was wild, I'd go into a bar. I wouldn't. I didn't care how big the guy was. I wasn't fr afraid. Fear was not a part of me. Now I grew up. I grew up on a farm in the country, and we were taught not to be afraid. And so when I went to church, a little bit, and all they want to do is scare me, I said, I ain't gonna buy that. The Bible says this: Fear hath torment. The Bible says this very clearly. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but love, power, and sound mind. So anytime they tried to manipulate me with fear, I would say, I ain't of God. And I will tell you right now, 99.9% .9 of every church ever were across this whole nation, across the whole world. That's how they're trying to move their people is through fear. Fear that you're going to burn in hell one of these days because you ain't come up to the... You hadn't come up and prayed the prayer or you haven't confessed all your sins and all your wrong. Fear is what they, they use and that's not God. God is not the author of fear. God is the author of love. And whenever you learn that, God is calling you into a dance with Him. With it. God is calling you into a game to play with it. With Him. And that game and that dance is living your life in union with that which is already in you. God called you to fight. That's what I remember when I started out. That's what they taught. We're going to do warfare against the devil, bless God. I come down here to this church. I built this church back in 1990 out there. And I would come down here sometimes at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And this is what they were. They, they wrote, some guy wrote a book back then. It was real popular, sold millions of copies. Could you not tarry one out? You know, like Jesus and the disciples, they couldn't stay awake. They went to sleep. He said, That's all right, go ahead and go back to sleep. You're too lazy to get up and do your own stuff and go back to sleep. Anyway, I'd come down here at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and I'd invite anybody who wanted to come down here with me. And we're going to pray for an hour. Then you can leave and go to work. All charged up, full of energy. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I mean, we pray and I'm just like, I, I, devil, I come against you in the name of Jesus. I cast you out of the north and south and east and west. And you know, hollering and screaming at the devil. Mm -hmm. Finally, I realized I'd saw her screaming at myself. Mm -hmm. Not only that, I wasted a couple more hours I could be sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been there and done that. Walked down that path. It was a part of the educational training that I needed to be what God wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I don't I don't recommend that. You know, I would recommend you get up and watch the sunrise and gaze into the sun for five minutes and just thank God for it and just mm -hmm. watch it pulse mm -hmm. and just take it into yourself because it's healing. Mm -hmm. It's deliverance. It gives you it gives you victory. It gives you answers. You you don't realize that God's speaking out of that sun as you in. To you, individually. And He's telling you the things that maybe you need to hear, the things that maybe you can do. And that adjust you. You'll have the power then you need. You ever tried to do something and just can't do it? Yeah, I know you have. Every one of us have. You know, we've gone on the diet, tried to quit cussing, tried to quit this, tried to quit that, and couldn't. Why? Why? Because you have all the power in the world you need. Let me tell you why you couldn't. Because you weren't tapped into the power. You weren't, you weren't here. We can confess until we're blue in the face. Well, I'm saying the right thing. Yeah. And your, your words are just strong like seeds on fallow ground. How are you going to get your words on good ground? Well, first you're going to have to hear... God, you're going to have to listen to that which is inside you. Mm -hmm. You got to get quiet, get find that silent moment, and so, so the journey, the journey of the sun is, and if uh, if I were to draw this, and you you see what I'm saying, and I realize it's confusing because I, I did this a few weeks ago and didn't do this. I just put this on the board with the four quarters of the of the. Uh, of the astrological wheel, fire, earth, air, and water. And these four quadrants will fall in this place, in these different places. Uh, and, and you start to see them. You'll start to see how that they will how that they will uh, come to pass. Now if I were to draw these three, this trinity over here, 
Here's how this would look. It would look a little bit different. Uh, I may have to do that in a different color. Let me see if I can if I can get this to write over that and it can be seen. Can y'all see that? Yes. 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 That is. Do y'all know what that is? Huh? Equilateral triangle. It's a, yeah, it's an upside down pyramid. It's the symbol for water. For water. That's the symbol for water. Why would that be the symbol? It's an ancient symbol. Why would it be the symbol for water? Because water always seeks its lowest point. Always. Water's heavy. Always seeks its lowest point. You pull water in here, and you'll find the low places in the floor. Right? It won't go to the high places. It'll go to the low places. You are 75 or more percent water. No wonder you're always seeking your lowest point. <laughs> the majority of you is built that way. Now what did I do? That's exactly right. This symbol right here is the symbol for fire. But when I lay them over top of each other in the astrological wheel, what did I just do? What is that called? Star David. It's called the Star of David, exactly. So that the, the character of David in the scriptures is the character of yourself that's constantly in battle against the giants. Have you had a have you have a habit? Have you ever had an addiction? Have you ever had something that just had a hold of you and you didn't have a hold of it, but it had you? <laughs> yeah, you sure have. Every one of us have. And you just can't seem to get a handle on it. You just can't seem to conquer it. You just can't seem to overcome it. Why? You haven't got the power. You haven't got your power. You got to get your power in the right place. And then you can. And then you can. I remember this. I started smoking when I, now to get this, I started smoking when I was four years old. Why? Because my big brother Richard, who was seven, eight year old, four year older than me, my big brother Richard, he put me up to it because he thought that was cute, a little four year old smoking. So he would put me up to going in the grocery store in the neighborhood, and he said, I'll get their, I'll get their attention back here, and you go up there and steal us a pack of cigarettes. Four year old. Oh, yeah, my big brother Richard, oh, he's going to let me have a cigarette. I'll go get it. <laughs> I'll go in there and steal him. And so I went in there and steal for him. So he let me smoke one of them. I remember the first one I smoked with Richard. He said, now, suck it in. <laughs> and I mean, cough my guts out. And not only that, I couldn't even hardly walk. Made me drunk. I said, that ain't good. I mean, Richard, he said, oh, you just got to keep, keep doing it. You got to keep doing it. <laughs> and so I would he put me up to it I would and finally I got to where I, I could tuck that in not cough a bit I just big as I was big as the Marlboro man then there you go I, I, yeah I can ride the horse just like the Marlboro man yes sir but then I noticed I can't seem to quit these things I got 16, 17 smoking two packs a day. Mm. You know, back then, you know, if we could get picky uni. I don't think you make them no more. Pick what? Pick a uni. Goo sometimes. Pick a uni was a cigarette, didn't have a filter on it, would make a camel mild as a lamb. Pick a uni was strong, strong cigarette. And it, and it sold back then, so you, we'd get pick a uni because it'd take you up another notch. <laughs> Oh, but then I, they had me. I didn't have them. Mm -hmm. And so, Connie and I both smoked. Connie started smoking when she was very young, too. She'd pick up cigarette nuts when her parents would flip them out. She'd go grab them and smoke them. And they thought it was cute. They didn't care. My mom and dad beat the fool out of me. 
even up until my mother died, I, I, well, I quit smoking a long time, but up until I quit smoking, I wouldn't dare as a married man, adult with kids, I wouldn't smoke in front of my mom. No way. Hey, <laughs> no way. I, I wasn't going to do that. But when I felt God deal with me and I had a dream, and God spoke to me in a dream out of the Scripture and said, I've called you to preach and to teach. And I thought that meant pastor. That was how I interpreted that passage of Scripture. I called you to be a priest. And so I thought, wow, okay, I smoked like a sailor at that time still. And so I had, had already had a powerful experience with God that changed my life. I quit cussing. That was big. That was really big. Because yeah. I cussed like a sailor. Smoked like a sailor. Cussed like a sailor. And so I, my life turned around. But then in cigarettes now, that's a different story. I'm going to tell you, they had me. You know, they had me by the, uh, you know. <laughs> and wouldn't turn me loose. Gonads, they had me by the gonads. I couldn't get nowhere. Oh, I was I was addicted. I, bought, I, had a, I was in tire business for myself, and I bought a gas station across the street from my tire business. And guess what that gas station had in it? A cigarette machine. Popular by everybody smoked in the 50s and 60s. Everybody, the Pope did, the bishops did, all the preachers did. It was the thing to do. Everybody smoked. I'm exaggerating, of course, but it seemed like everybody smoked. I bought that. Well, then God spoke to me in that dream, and I thought, well, okay. And then God said, I want you to quit smoking. I spoke that in my heart. I ain't no way. I ain't gonna do that. I can't do that. Why? I mean, all these my preachers smoke. All these my pope smokes. You want me to quit smoking? I ain't no way. I argued with that, and then finally that won out, and then I entered into the hardest battle I think I've ever entered into in my life, and that was to stop smoking. And I bought that gas station. I had started that quest. I'm not gonna smoke. I quit. And I laid them down. I laid them down. Hadn't picked up one since. That's been 45 years ago at least. Hadn't picked up one since. Smoked till I was about 30 something. Laid them down. I bought that gas station. Had that cigarette machine. That was a pretty decent little money maker. It'd bring me in a few hundred dollars a month because everybody smoked, so I sold a lot of cigarettes. You can sell a lot of habit stuff. <laughs> but if it make, if it'll addict you, boy, you put you up a store, you can sell it. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to open that, and I'm gonna tell you right now, them cigarettes, I'd have to think that was the best smell I ever smelled in my life. Mm -hmm. Especially Swisher Sweet cigars, little bit Swisher. Do they still make those? Uh huh. Pouch, y'all did. If I hadn't have had that voice speak inside here, I would never have had the power because it had me. But I had the power to do it. But I had to stand on that power and I had to walk it out. And it was difficult. I hadn't smoked one since. I haven't smoked a cigarette since, since that time, 40-something years ago. But I had to get clear. Folks, I'm trying to, get, I'm trying to draw a point. You've got to get clear on what is God. If you're thinking God is an old man out yonder somewhere building you a house, you've got to change that. God is the Son, S-U-N. And that Son is the very life of your being. And when it starts out right here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, most misunderstood passage in the whole Bible, the very first verse right out of the start gate is so far off the track. It says, in the beginning, God. That word God, right there. That word God in Hebrew is the Hebrew word Elohim. And actually it's referring to the entire astrological wheel that has encompassed both fire and water to make it one. And if we can come to that Understanding, and we realize right out of the starting gate, God is it, the very first verse, the very first time God is mentioned is the Hebrew word Elohim. Uh, spell it. A 
H-Y-M or it can be spelled with H-Y-I-M, either way, because it's, it's, it's the Alif, the Lamid, the He, the Ayin, and the Mim. Mim is always water. In this word, it encompasses this entire wheel. And when you understand that God, or the Elohim, it, it actually, it, it should have been translated accurately with an S on the end of it. Gods. How many gods are there? There are 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There are 12 gods. That's why there are 12 gods children of Israel, 12 sons of Jacob. That's why there are 12 apostles. That's why there are 12 disciples. That's why there are 12 foundation stones in the book of Revelation of the temple of God, which is your body. That is God. God is the very foundation of your being. And if you get that and you understand that and realize it's not a man out yonder, it's the source, the fire, the energy. When you gaze into that fire, the sun in the morning or in the evening, when you gaze into that, you are sparking and you are adding to the fire that's already in you. Mm -hmm. That is God. Mm -hmm. so it, that's what God is. God is fire. Yes. God is the source. God is the source of your being. Yes. Whew. I close with this. I want to read this. This is the Emerald Tablet. The Emerald Tablet is a document that is attributed to two Hermes Trismegistus 36,000 years ago. And I want to read you what the Emerald Tablet is broken down into seven basic paragraphs. Seven. I don't have my stick man drawn up here. But when I say seven, right here he is. Right here is my stick man. Seven endocrine glands. The seven functions. And we call it the seven days of creation. And so the Emerald Tablet is broken up into seven paragraphs. All this is not coincidental. All this is a divine purpose. And the first one is, here's the first paragraph. In truth and without deceit, certain and most variable. That's the very first thing. Anything he's going to say from here on is non-negotiable, period. That which is below, i.e. the earth, i.e. me, i.e. you, that which is below corresponds to that which is above. And that which is above corresponds, corresponds to that which is below to accomplish the miracle of the one thing. Hmm, what is that? Touch yourself. Say, so that's me. That's me. And just as all things have come from this one thing through the mediation of one mind, one mind, so do all created things originate from this one thing through transformation. That's the second paragraph. Now I'm just going to stop at that one because if I get all into the rest of this, I'll go to back to preaching it. And we'll just be here another hour without question. What I'm saying is. The sun is there for you here, and you're here to draw off the sun there, to take the two and make them one and unite yourself with yourself. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That's where your power is at. Amen. I'll quit right there. Okay. Amen.